Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am really delighted to be here for the 100th anniversary of the Chamber of Commerce here in France. Your organization embodies the long and close relationship between Sweden and France that has existed for centuries. And I'm happy to say, as Trade Commissioner, that the first treaty between Sweden and France, signed 500 years ago, was a trade agreement. Among other things, it allowed the Swedes to export their herring to France, and France to export their wine to Sweden. So our trade relationship has changed a little since then, but it's important to know that back then we got things right from the beginning. Maybe the most relevant bit of Franco-Swedish history today, especially today, today, uh, that the climate talks open here in Paris, is this one. Anders Celsius, a great Swedish scientist. He worked for a time here in Paris. He cooperated with the French scientists throughout his life, and he was rewarded with a pension from Louis XV. He also invented the Celsius temperature scale, as you know. So as our leaders, as we speak now, do their best to reach the two-degree target, they have Franco-Swedish cooperation to thank for the way they measure it. But the fact that we are meeting here on such an important day also shows how difficult times we're living in, and everybody has referred to this. The climate and environment challenge is, of course, acute. And unfortunately, that's only one challenge we're facing. We meet today in Paris, and we are reminded of the horrors that happened here only two weeks ago. We have all suffered with the victims and their relatives, but also admired the dignity and the pride of the French people in dealing with that tragedy. So climate and terrorism are only two challenges. Another one is, of course, securing the economic future of our people here at home in the European Union, but also in the wider world, and to make sure that we can improve the living conditions of people in the poor countries. And it's easy to see all these challenges as daunting, and some may say, no, it's unsurmountable. But the fact that we are here for our 100th university should give us hope. As a moderator has said, 100 years ago, we had the first world war here in Europe, in North Africa, in the Middle East, and the seeds were being sown already for the second global conflict, beginning 25 years later. And yet, the last century has given us a lot of hope. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, women's suffrage, and the expansion of civil rights. The achievement in the West of the highest living standards in the world. And in recent decades, the incredible economic changes in developing countries that has lifted millions of people out of poverty. So why, while we do live in interesting times, we must never forget that we do have the capacity to address those challenges, provided that we bring clear-eyed analysis, determination, creativity, and leadership. And the fact that we are here today shows that there are many leaders here in the audience who want to bring that. As the European Union Trade Commissioner, I believe that trade has an important responsibility to help to solve some of those challenges. And I also believe that the right kind of trade policy has the capacity to do so. In October, we in the European Commission set out a new trade strategy that will help us do that in several ways. First, the new approach to trade, we want to make sure that we use trade as a tool to foster prosperity in Europe. We still have millions of people unemployed in Europe and we have not recovered fully from the crisis. We must provide economic opportunities for the citizens. Second, the right kind of trade policy is also a tool to promote growth and development, particularly in the poorest countries. Tackling extreme poverty in the de developing world is vital to address challenges such as migration, political instability and violence. And third, a modern trade policy can also go beyond economics. It must be in tune with Europe's values. And that means that it can help us to reach key global objectives, like better protection of human rights, labor rights, sustainable development. But let's start with the economic growth here at home. Trade is more important than ever for the economic uh, recovery and for Europe's economy. 90% of global growth the coming decades will come from outside Europe. 
So we must be there to connect with that growth. And 31 million jobs today in Europe, that's almost one in seven, depend on our exports to the world. And those jobs depend on our own single market, by the way. For example, Sweden's export outside the EU supports 14,000 jobs here in France. And France exports supports 7,000 jobs in Sweden. And benefits are not only from exports, because 80% of our imports are used in the production of other goods and services that are then vital for our competitiveness in the rest of the world. And that is why Europe has a long tradition of uh, policy of economic openness. And that's a good thing. But as we prepared our new strategy, we also saw that the economy and trade was changing. Global value chains, as you know, many of you deal with this uh, every hour, are now a central part of the European and world economies. Services are a growing importance for international trade, and digital services in particular have a new role in our economic lives. And we increasingly need qualified people to cross borders in order for international trade to happen. And you are all aware of this, of course, but the European Union trade policy had not really adjusted to that new reality. So that's why we must change and we must deliver growth and jobs so we can address these issues. We also saw that there is a very intense debate going on in Europe on trade. Long time ago, trade agreements were done within closed rooms, a few dedicated nerds, and nobody really cared. And we came out with the trade agreements, people said, mm-hmm, good. But now people want to be involved, they want to participate they want to feel ownership, they want to know what is being discussed. Um, and that's why trade policy is more than ever on the general political agenda, and that's a good thing. But that means that we need to engage with citizens, with different stakeholders to talk about trade, to explain, to involve them. And we are now aiming also to make sure that they see the benefits of trade, and that trade is economically effective. And trade can only be effective if it tackles today's barriers. The barriers in the past were very much about tariffs. Today we need to focus more on regulatory cooperation, but also on facilitating for services, digital trade, mobility. And we need to make sure that everybody can feel the, uh, the benefits of trade. We need to analyze the impact trade has on consumers, we need to include tools, especially information tools, to help small and medium-sized companies to take advantage of the agreements that we have. Because we have seen that we do negotiate a lot of good agreements, but small and medium-sized companies don't really have the tools uh, to use it. And we need to make sure that also uh, the jobs linked to trade, that workers will re uh, benefit from a review of the Globalization Adjustment Fund to make that much more effective. And we will also become more economically effective by targeting our negotiations. That means to prioritize on the multilateral level the World Trade Organization. In just two weeks, I will travel to Nairobi for the ministerial conference with the whole world. 161 countries are members of WTO. And we will see if we finally, after 14 years, can come to some sort of agreement in the Doha round, especially focusing on the least developed countries of the world. But it also means to make sure that our bilateral agreements can be tools to support the multilateral process in the long term. That is why our bilateral agreements, starting with TTIP, the agreement that the EU is negotiating with the US, must be open once it's ready for others if they want to join, if they fulfill the conditions. And it also means that all other uh, ongoing negotiations with Japan and um, the investment agreement that we're doing with China needs to be uh, concluded. And on Wednesday, we will confirm the conclusion of the free trade agreement between Europe and uh, Vietnam, a very big uh, agreement indeed. We are also opening the door to new negotiations. Sometimes when you listen to the debate, you get the feeling that it's only TTIP that is there. But we are negotiating with a variety of different countries. As I said, Japan, we have just concluded with Singapore and Canada, with Vietnam uh, this week. We negotiate an investment agreement with China, and we are starting the process to, to uh, new negotiations with um, Australia, 
New Zealand, uh, Turkey, Mexico, Chile, and possibly other countries in Asia and, um, and uh, Latin America. And that's what trade policy is doing, because it's creating new economic possibilities. We should also make sure that we can use trade to support economic growth and development outside the European Union. If you, if you doubt that trade can have an, have an influence there, look around the world and uh, the best examples of development. The countries who have had the most success uh, grew as they expanded their exports and gradually opened their markets for more import. And the EU is already at the forefront when it comes to use trade as a policy to foster development. We are the most up open market here in the European Union for developing countries. Since we put in place the Everything But Arms initiative 15 years ago, there are no quotas and no tariffs on the exports of the world's least developed economies to the European Union. And as a result, energy excluded, we import more from these countries than the US, Canada, Japan and China put together. On top of this, we also offer easier access to our market for middle-income countries, targeted at areas where they are most needed. We are putting in place a comprehensive set of economic partnership agreements with over 70 countries in Africa, Caribbean and the Pacific. They are regional agreements and they give these countries asymmetric agreements. So they have full access to our market, but they open only gradually their market in order for them to, to, to catch up with development and that can truly spur development in these countries. We are also in the European Union the largest provider for aid for trade to the tune of 11 billion euros per year. And that money supports physical infrastructure like ports and border crossing, but also virtual infrastructure, technical capacity, training of customs officers or helping companies to meet international food safety and environmental standards so that they can compete on the global market. And in the new trade strategy, we promise that the EU will intensify its work to put trade policy at the service of development. For instance, last week, um, we announced that we were prepared to offer trade preferences for services as well as for good for the poorest countries. And we are working to make sure that in Nairobi in two weeks, the rest of the world will agree as well to this in, 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 in addition to, to hopefully the, the um, agreements in related to the Doha round. <coughs> the final set of global challenges that trade policies can help us address goes beyond economics altogether. Because the recent debate in Europe, but also elsewhere, shown that people want trade policy to deliver jobs, growth and investment, but also to be in tune with European values. And that means, of course, not undermining our values at all as trade policy becomes more involved with regulatory policies in order to open new markets, we must always respect the objectives of that regulation. And that means that nothing in trade deals will ever limit EU's right to make policy in the public interest. And no trade agreement will ever lower the levels of consumer protection or environmental, labour or social protection. <coughs> Sorry. And any changes to that protection can only be upwards. We have also proposed a reform to the current system of investment protection agreement and brought more transparency to our free trade agreement negotiations. Today, the TTIP negotiation uh, is very transparent. All European proposals uh, are online to see. All the summaries of the negotiation rounds are online and we will continue that transparency with all other ongoing and future negotiations. And these new approaches are essential because they can assure that trade and policies to um, ensure sustainability at home and abroad can work hand in hand. They can also provide the necessary trust that trade policy today need. And trade policy is also an opportunity for trade to support broader objectives abroad, human rights, labour rights and environment. We are negotiating um, uh, and, and hopefully we'll put that in the WTO very soon, an agreement on environmental goods and services. And they aim to support the work that is ongoing here today by eliminating trade barriers on products that provide renewable energy and encourage uh, energy efficiency. And that lowers the cost and makes widespread adoption easier and cheaper. 
We have an initiative since two years ago going on with uh, companies because it's important here to work very closely with you, with companies, in order to, to achieve those goals. For instance, in the garment factories in Bangladesh, you will remember that two years ago there was a terrible accident in Rana Plaza where over 2,000 men, uh, women and girls died in an, in, in an accident there. And since then we have put, for, put, uh, put up um, a compact, a Bangladesh compact, the European Union working with ILO and many, many companies to help the Bangladeshi government to improve the standards in the factories, uh, to make sure that they are allowed to organize the people who, who work there and that, that uh, the, the, the safety increases. And that is a way to, to improve the conditions for the women and girls who work there. So we use free trade agreements to hire and the, um, those standards. Our partners commit to key international principles and to strict monitoring procedures to ensure that process is being made. We link in many agreements um, the respect of international conventions to trade preferences. And by doing that, we also help the development. And they are, the more they are willing to do so, the more access they get, get to the European market. And in our new trade strategy, we aim to make all of these provisions more effective by taking better care of the implementation, of course, and working with international partners. Your Majesty, ladies and gentlemen, of course trade cannot solve all the problems of the world, but it can contribute. It can help us to provide prosperity to our citizens, promote development around the world, along with the political stability that goes with it, and support broader objectives uh, in tune with our values, human rights, labour rights, environmental protection. And that's a contribution we have the responsibility to make. And I know that many of the companies represented here today in, our daily, in your daily uh, work on corporate social responsibility, you are very active in doing this as well. And as we do so, we can again be inspired by a final French-Swedish connection. Alfred Nobel, he was a businessman, uh, but he, with his will, he aimed to use his fortune to promote scientific culture and political advancement. You all know that, of course. And I think we can agree that, that uh, Alfred Nobel's legacy had a certain impact. And where did he write his will? Here, in Paris. So the standard is set very high for the result of this Franco-Swedish conference today. There are lots of historical links, uh, actual links, and hopefully even more links for the future as well. So I wish you all the best for this conference, and thank you again for giving me the possibility uh, to introduce it. Thank you. Um, just a very, very quick, maybe follow-up question. Uh, as you are presenting the agenda, it's a very positive agenda about uh, TTIP, also about other trade negotiations, and even, even slight positive about WTO. Uh, I agree. Optimism we have is a duty. Exactly. Um, when we are looking at the different pressures on Europe right now, um, in terms of refugee crisis, in terms of um, challenges, uh, youth unemployment, etc., would you say that these processes are pushing the agenda forward, or, or do we face challenges in keeping the European Union really focusing on bringing these important agreements uh, to a conclusion? Of course, there are so many things on the European agenda today uh, and many important challenges that are also challenging the European Union's capacity to, to deal with it and, and its internal coherence. But I would say that there is a link that most people in this room have been aware of for, for a long time, but is becoming reality also for others, that we, trade can play a very important role in fostering um, stability and economic growth in developing countries. I was in uh, Tunisia a month ago. Tunisia is often described as the success of the Arab Spring. It's a very fragile uh, democracy. They have been under lots of terrorist threats and others lately, but they are struggling. They are really wanting to do. And we launched uh, a free trade agreement with them, uh, which is asymmetrical, so they will have bigger access to our market. And we will also include a lot of development assistance to help them to build up their capacity to be able to trade. And of course, uh, if people have the opportunities to stay in their countries where, where there is economic possibility so they can sustain their family and, and, and themselves, 
they will not have to move. Mm. And we're identifying lots of other countries in Africa, especially, in order to, to try to contribute to create those mm. circumstances. Of course, it has a link. It's not a quick fix. It takes years, but it's a way to, to liaise with those countries and um, also have, uh, have exchange of, of, of ideas of people apart from the, the, cure, the, the, the key economic mm -hmm. advantages. So it is linked. But, but sometimes what we see is we have short-term sort of emergencies that we have to deal with and, and what you're talking about is a long-term agenda. And, and yes, for us involved in the COP, uh, we, we face the same challenge. Mm -hmm. Climate change is seen as a bit more distant in some cases and, and we have more mm. short-term challenges. Is, is that a problem today or can you believe that the union can still f manage to focus on long-term issues? Well, we have to. Today there is such a, everything is so urgent. You have to fix things quick and you have to be able to explain it 140 signs on Twitter. But life doesn't work like that uh, and, and things take time. But we also did not start yesterday. Those trade agreements have been uh, ongoing, or negotiations have been ongoing for years. Some of them are, are ripe now, like the one with, with Vietnam. It will mean a lot for the Vietnamese people. Of course, it's also good for us. Uh, as I referred to in my speech, we have been negotiating for quite some year uh, uh, an agreement on, on green goods, where we try to eliminate uh, tariffs on, on environmentally friendly goods, establish a list of hundreds of or products, hopefully that can grow in the future. That has been going on for a long time. Mm. Hopefully we can conclude quite soon with that. So, so, so things do take time, uh, but, but uh, they, they need to take time as well, because if you want to get it right, you, you need some quality. In, it. in this conference here today, we will have two excellent panels mm -hmm. focus on, uh, focusing on two very important uh, issues, as you know, digitalization mm -hmm. and, and sustainability. And even in the, in the context of the climate negotiations, we can quite often see that new, not new, but other actors are taking the lead, companies, cities, mm -hmm. regions. Um, if you're looking at the, the sort of trade agenda, um, what role do you think companies can play in order to support the political process? Uh, is there any specific sort of role that companies should play and could play to really push the agenda forward in a positive sense? Well, of course, without companies, there wouldn't be any trade. So, so they, they are the, 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 the bone uh, of, of all trade agreements. And many companies, and I try to, 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 to give examples, of many companies have for years worked on, on a, uh, a corporate social responsibility agenda and have been working both here, we talk about Swedish company and French companies, to promote the values that we have here in Europe, in the countries where they act, where they try to improve the situation uh, for, for the people here as well. Uh, we see also, um, as you said, cities who are involved. There's a big initiative for, for more fair trade mm. where many cities are, are involved. We try to reach out with them and see if we can cooperate together. So, so of course, I mean, without, without companies, there wouldn't be, be anything. And today there is a debate, uh, and I hear it very often as I travel all around Europe, that, that People don't see why, why, why should we involve the companies mm. in, in, in all this. Companies are not seen as, as something positive always. Mm. There's sort of a shift here in, in the climate, in the current debate, uh, which is very problematic. Mm. Because of course trade can promote all these values, but more importantly, trade and companies contribute to, to, to the growth and the, the, the addressing the, the economic problems that we still are facing in Europe. And maybe just finish on, on, on following up on that question. As you say, there is still debate and, and people are expressing some concern about TTIP and I quite often, as you say, there is critique coming from, from maybe the environmental side in particular, but also consumer organizations and so on. Is there any validity in the criticism and, and what, what is it that we can do in order to ensure that, that we can respond to uh, the critique and maybe demonstrate that this is actually a fear that we shouldn't have for, for these agreements? transparency, I, I mm. think, to show that we are actually not part of a big secret plot to undermine democracy and, and uh, consumer uh, standards as, as we know them, um, but also involvement to make sure, uh, and I and my team, we really try to reach out to people, uh, to talk to them about their fear, fears. People are afraid that, that TTIP, for instance, will undermine 
uh, the economic protect the environmental protection or consumer protection. But of course, in the US, they have the same fear. They also have very high protection. And some, some uh, things are more protected in the US than here. We have the, 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 the Volkswagen scandal was discovered in the US, for instance. And there are other areas where, where they have much higher standards. But we are not aiming to, to, to harmonize or to lower. We are only looking at regulatory cooperation mm. in a lot of technical areas, very important, but where they're equal. So we don't have to be double testing. If I want to sell this in the US, I first have to test it the European way to make sure it doesn't burn up, the inflammability test. And then I have to test it exactly the same way again to sell it in the US. If one test was enough, I could save a lot of money mm. and a lot of time and a lot of paperwork. So these are the kinds of things we, we are working at. But you need to engage. And there, of course, company has a role as well to explain why, what, what more possibilities could an agreement like TTIP yeah. bring for them. And how would then that benefit so that they can employ more people or maybe invest more money. Uh, for the money that, that, that they gain, and that would be beneficial for, for our economy. So engagement, inclusiveness, examples, and transparency. But um, the debate is, is, is difficult today. Thank you very much, Commissioner Malmström, for joining us today in your tight schedule. So thank you.